So that's the intro done, uh, which means that I now get to chat to you about uh, conversation-driven development at scale. So I firstly want to just quickly take a step back and talk about some of the motivations why why we need an approach like this in the first place. Why CDD? Why conversation-driven development? And if we think about what we're trying to achieve with conversational AI and building a better customer experience, ultimately what we're trying to do is help translate between a large complex organization like an enterprise and the reality of the customer that we're trying to help, right? And so instead of forcing a person to navigate our org chart or asking them to know the particulars of of how we organize things and all the things that we do for them, we're coming in and we're, we're helping figure out how we can help them, right? And the challenge is we're trying to do that translation in an automated way. We're trying to speak the user's language. We're trying to meet them where they are rather than imposing our assumptions and our structure upon them, right? And that's really the magical thing that we're trying to achieve. And of course, to do that means that you have a, a single brand that speaks to your customer, right? And that def- doesn't differentiate between like what particular channel they're contacting you on uh, or what particular one of your products they want to talk about today, right? It's all sort of uh, fluid and seamless. And so to get to that point where we speak the user's language, right, what does that mean? And so a year ago, we presented the updated uh, five levels of conversational AI. And from an end user perspective, the common thread is that we require less and less of the end user to translate what they want into something that we can do for them, right? So rather than giving them a form to fill out and them having to know which form to fill out and exactly which details to fill in, um, we're guiding them through that process, right? And we'll be more and more accommodating of, of the concepts that are in the user's mind of the reality that they live in and speaking their language. And so as we make progress on those five levels, it's not just that the end user experience evolves, but actually the the maker, the developer experience evolves as well, right? And so there's quite a significant difference in how you build these assistants when you want to really be accommodating of end users rather than just giving them a rigid framework that they have to navigate, right? And so CDD is really just about making progress on the five levels. Right. So if we want to go from a level two chatbot to a level three contextual assistant and beyond, the way we do that is by listening to our users, listening what they're saying to our assistants and incorporating those insights to make the assistant better for them. And so that surely is a very uncontroversial thing to want to do. And so the CDD framework is made up of six actions, right? And um, so sharing, making sure that, you know, very early on in the process, you are sharing your assistant with the people it's intended to help and getting their feedback and getting exposed to what they're trying to do with it. Actually reviewing those conversations, making sure that you do look at them and understand and empathize and understand what's going on. Uh, spending time annotating, making sure that the training data that feeds into your assistant is based on real messages, like real things that users are saying and not some synthetic data. Uh, testing, making sure that you have good test coverage right, that you don't introduce regressions, that you're not sort of piecing together um, broken fixes and and workarounds all the time, but that you have a good sort of rigorous uh, basis for development. Tracking, making sure that you have good metrics to track how many users are you helping and how well are you helping them so that you can also measure the progress over time of all this other work that you're doing. And then finally fixing, having a systematic way of identifying places where your assistant isn't helping users and addressing those things. And so the point I want to make is that CDD reduces time to value. And I really want to stress the word value there because that's really the key operative word. And so the first thing we have to acknowledge is that this is the the place where every single conversational AI project starts. You have a certain number of things that you've built, a certain number of conversations that you've implemented. um, And then there are all sorts of other things that users are going to do and say, right? And when you give that to, you you know, you give the first version of your assistant to people, they're going to surprise you, right? They're going to say things that you didn't anticipate. 
They're going to say lots of things you didn't anticipate, and they're going to go down paths you didn't anticipate, and they're going to respond to the things that you said in ways that you hadn't expected. And so the important thing to remember about that is that that's just a fact. That's just something we have to deal with, right? There is no way to anticipate all the things that users are going to say. We're giving them free text input. We're letting them speak their mind, right? And so we should embrace it. It has nothing to do with what technology we're using. It has nothing to do with what model we're using. It's just a question of how do we get exposed as quickly as possible to the reality of what our users are trying to do for us. And so CDD, <laughs> right? We want to use insights to improve our AI system. And ultimately what we're just trying to do is create a lot of overlap, right? So that the things that we've implemented are in fact the things that users are trying to say and do. And so CDD is just about maximizing the overlap between those circles. What your assistant does, what users want it to do. And so if you're not practicing CDD and you're not getting users in early, what you do is you go and you build a bunch of stuff. And then when you finally get test users, then you're confronted with the fact that there's very little overlap with these circles, right? So you've built a bunch of stuff, builds out a bunch of flows that are just never going to happen, right? Because you can't anticipate all of this stuff. And so a lot of this is wasted effort. Whereas if you're bringing test users in very early, you're exposing them to the assistant, you're letting them tell you what they want, and you're being exposed to their needs and desires and quirks and, and follow-up questions and all of those things, and you iterate from there, the things that you build are actually going to cause overlap. They're going to overlap with the things that users are actually expecting from you, right? So it's really, really crucial to get them involved early on so that you don't waste effort, right? Because, yeah, you need to spend a bit of time getting test users in and recruiting them, but ultimately the thing that you ship is going to be far more valuable than if you go off into the mountains for months implement a bunch of stuff, and then realize that that's not how users actually behave and interact with your system. And so I want to touch on a couple of common misconceptions, I would say, about CDD. Um, the first is that CDD is like optional, or it's some kind of you know nice to have thing if you want to build something more sophisticated. It's not, it's, it's absolutely essential, right? The alternative to practicing CDD is not something easy. The alternative is just being stuck with circles that don't overlap and being stuck building a bunch of stuff that doesn't help your users. Um, the second is that CDD is some kind of huge amount of work, right? That reviewing and annotating is, is, uh, isn't scalable. And I want to talk about some of the work that we're doing to make CDD extremely efficient. And then finally, the idea that CDD is just a process for tweaking existing bots. And I hope that the slides I showed earlier really motivate, motivate the point that you want to be practicing this at the start. If you're only introducing this later, you're kind of missing the point. So I want to talk a little bit about you know, tools and processes and systems for practicing CDD at scale. And so the first thing I want to show is the, the full cycle workflow that we've worked out for improving just one piece of your system, which is the NLU model. So this demo is showing the NLU inbox inside of Raza. And so it's a very straightforward idea that applies to any production machine learning application, right? You have a model, it's running, it's making predictions. And then you're going and reviewing the predictions that your model made as a human who knows best. Uh, and you're either saying, yeah, you got this right, or no, here's where you made a mistake, right? So you're seeing um, all these predictions and you're using you know, that human labeling effort, that human annotation effort to improve the system over time, right? And we've had this feature since we first launched Raza X two years ago, right? This has been around for ages. Um, and it's certainly not even the first product by a long way to have introduced something like this. But of course, very quickly, you know, you get to a scale where this NLU inbox contains far more things than you could ever look at. And that's also really not the intention, right? Many of our customers are receiving hundreds of thousands of conversations every week. And so what we have is a workflow for honing in and spending time efficiently and really knowing that what you're doing 
um, is actually is actually a good investment of your time. And so the scorecard, which we're looking at here, rates the readiness of your assistant in various places. And this one has a moderately good, but not fantastic training data health score of about two and a half. And so we can see how that's broken down here. And we see that there are a whole bunch of warnings from our NLU data uh, about having not enough training data and having intents that are confused together, et cetera. And what those warnings correspond to is the insight screen. And so this runs a nightly analysis of your training data, as well as all the predictions that your model's been making and identifies like weaknesses or areas to improve your training data so that you're going to have better performance. And so we're looking at a list of intents. Uh, they're sorted by worst performing, being on top. Uh, and we can see, for example, that uh, we have an intent called explain. It has a very poor recall. Uh, we can also see that it doesn't have a lot of training data. And so we know that this is an area we can invest in and we're going to make a meaningful improvement to our system. Right? So when we click on annotate more examples, we go back to that NLU inbox which contains real messages, real things that users have said to our assistant, right? Where the model made this prediction and we can check if those are correct, right? So it's now filtered down and we know that these are the things that are gonna help improve the uh, explain intent. And so we can do a bulk selection rather than just doing things one at a time. And we can say, hey, look, these are all great examples of real users in the way that they say, explain, explain this to me, right? And so it's a very efficient way of saying, if I've got 10 minutes to spend, how am I gonna spend those 10 minutes to really maximize the impact on my NLU model, right? And then finally, when this gets added to your training data, it becomes part of the next model, the number of warnings will go down. And when you go back to your scorecard, you'll see that your training data health will be improving. And so on the NLU model side, and certainly for the intent classification side, we've kind of worked this out, right? You have a, a full workflow for going through this and knowing that the changes that you're making are improving your performance over time. And so the next frontier that we're working on is, can we do the same, not for the NLU part, but for the dialogue part, right? And so what you can already do today with Raza is you have all these conversations, hundreds of thousands or millions of them, uh, and you have this Swiss army knife of powerful filters to look for things that are going to be interesting, right? You can search for conversations that contain a fallback, uh, conversations with low confidence, specific intents you know are problematic or actions that are interesting. Um, but ultimately that's still requiring you to do a lot of that work. So how can we get to a point that Rosal is proactive in the same way as it is for LU and tells you, here's where you should spend some time, right? Um, and so we've been working on a model called Intent Ted, um, and then, the, you know, the first version is going to go out in, uh, in a month or so. And what it does is rather than try and predict what the assistant should do next, it tries to predict what the user is going to do next. And when that model is confused, that's a good indication that, hey, this is a, this is a novel or interesting or unusual thing, right? So here's where you should go and focus your attention. These are the edge cases. These are the cases you should look at, right? And so we're sort of turning that into a similar kind of full cycle workflow so you can know that if you've got, you know, 10 minutes to go and uh, improve your dialogue model, you know where to look, you know what to do, and you can see the benefits. And so that's a very limited uh, view on what scale is. <laughs> uh, and so far, we've only talked about the sheer volume of conversations that's coming in. Um, but of course, there's a lot more to it than that. And in uh, the Rouse Summit talk that I gave at the start of this year, we talked about all the different types of scale and all the different ways that this shows up uh, when you're building an assistant in, in an enterprise setting. And so one of those dimensions is scaling the team who is doing this annotation, right? And so Workspaces is a feature you can look forward to. Um, it's also sort of in the pipeline landing pretty soon. And what it does is it gives you a true sort of multi-party workflow so that everybody can, you know, split up annotation work, make their changes, divide and conquer without anybody stepping on each other's toes. And then another aspect of scale is just the sophistication of your assistant, 
right? And the number of intents and interactions and user goals that you're covering. And something you've probably heard us talk about a lot at Raza is, you know, breaking free from intents, right? Breaking free from this tyranny of, of insisting that every user message has to neatly fit into one of your predefined buckets. And so evolving all of this tooling to be sure that when you have a system which can handle sort of end-to-end -end processing, which can handle, you know, an intent-free design, that all of these workflows still work and you can still practice CDD um, and it actually becomes easier rather than harder. And of course, going from just having lots of people all working on the same assistant, having lots of different teams working on multiple assistants, which have some shared functionality, right? So you have a kind of multi-in, multi-out setup. Um, and then you're encountering utterances, which somehow sit between two different teams or sit between two different use cases um, and thinking through all of that and being really deliberate about how do you come to a resolution, right? Um, how do you deal with all of those edge cases? That's another side of, of scale. And so the take home message I really just want you to, to, to go home with are the kind of dispelling the three myths that I mentioned at the start of the talk, right? So remembering that the CDD isn't an optional thing. It's, it's just dealing with the reality and dealing with it in the most efficient way possible that it doesn't have to be a huge amount of manual work. You can be very focused with the right tooling uh, and be sure that you're you know, getting maximum bang for your buck when you're investing time. Uh, and then finally, that it's not something that you do on day two, you do at the end of the process. Once you already have everything else implemented, it's something you bring in as early as you possibly can get some test users in. So with that, um, I'm wrapping up the keynote. Uh, we'll have some time for Q&A, so of course you can ask your questions in here. If you want to tell me that I'm wrong about everything and write me a long essay, that's fine as well. Uh, please shoot me an email. It's easy to remember. And uh, thanks all for listening. And uh, have a wonderful day at L3AI. I know I'm looking forward to all of the talks. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening.